Hello, and welcome to an edition of Python Development. This is the first intro course to it. My name is Nate Nessler, and this is for Hyperactive Studios. Now, we're going to go in into www.python.org right here. And this language is really easy to learn. Uh, if you're first starting with programming, this is definitely the language you want to start with. It's probably the easiest language to learn in programming. And then to top it off, it actually has a lot of depth. So you can actually keep using it way later on for handling really large projects. Most languages where it's really easy to learn, you really can't do a whole lot with them. But in the case of Python, that's not true. You can actually do a whole lot with it, and it's real easy to pick up and start going with it. So first off, we need to download and install it. Now this is free software because it's open source, which means that uh, anyone can access the code to it. So what we're going to do is just we're just going to download this programming language. It's free. It also gives us uh, the means in order to write code with it. So that way we can tell the computer to do anything we want it to do. And this makes life a lot easier um, as far as automating tasks like you could do anything you could make it control robots you could make games with it you could uh, process business forms and paperwork you can automate tasks you could do security with it you could do uh, networks clients servers chat programs you name it. anything you can imagine basically uh, you can do with it it's really really powerful it's used by NASA it's used by uh, uh, web development with the Django I mean it's used by uh, tons and tons of companies, scientific applications. You could use it for medical too, or chemis chemical, like chemistry and uh, physics. But anyways, all that aside, if I just go to the downloads here, we can go here and what you want to do is choose your download. Now we're going to go with there's two different versions. They actually change the language slightly between two seven and like three two or three three here dot two. Uh, your edition may be different by the time you go to download this, but um, all Python is moving over to the newer edition now. Uh, it's taken some years for that to happen because there was a ton of code written in the older 2.7 stuff. Uh, and the changes were slight, so a lot of people didn't feel uh, the need to really uh, rewrite a bunch of their code. And some of these coding libraries were kind of significant, so um, that's kind of, I mean, there's a ton of it, you know, so it's a lot to translate over to the newer one. But um, we're starting to see that migration happening more and more now. So I'm going to teach this on the newer one, since that's probably what you will be encountering uh, here in the future and everything. But anyways, um, just feel free to pop on here. Now, if you have a 64-bit operating system on here for Windows, you're going to want to download this one right here, x86-64 MSI installer. If you have a 32-bit one, uh, then you're going to need to download this one here. If you're not sure and you're on Windows which one it is, you need to come over here to your control panel. And we wait for it. All right. And you're going to go to System. And System will tell you. In this case, I have, looks like a 64-bit uh, right here. So it says System Type right here. Uh, and they say 64-bit operating system. So you can see that right there, and then that lets me know that that's the one I need. So for me, I need this one right here. Now, if I'm on the Mac, I'm going to download them on the Mac ones here. Or if I'm on Linux, I can download with these. These are tarballs, though. If you're on Linux and you're on Red Hat or CentOS or one of those, you can use an RPM installer, and you can just use yum, yum space install space, and then uh, Python, and that will download Python. You can do the same thing in Ubuntu for Debian. If you have one of the Debian type packages uh, installations for your in Linux on that one. So if you have that, then you're going to do uh, sudo space app dash get space install space uh, and then uh, Python. So depending on which one you're installing for, uh, you know, depends on that. But in this case, I'm going to assume you have Windows, so I'm just going to click on the Windows installer. All right, great. I'll click on that and download. Awesomeness. Uh, and I'm just going to come over here. And you know, put it wherever you feel like it's necessary. So put that on there with that. And we're going to get that downloading. And after it's done downloading, we can install it. There it is. Uh, and I'm going to say, uh, always open for, ask before opening. Yeah. I'm going to say run. And install it for all users, not just me. Next. I can choose where I want to install it. Yeah, that sounds great for its location. 
for me. So I'm just going to go ahead and say next. Uh, and here's all the different tools it's going to provide us, which is what we want. The other thing that's great about the Python here is that uh, this runs on all the computers. So you can make this run on uh, Windows, Linux, Mac OS X. You can see the different installs for it like that. But it also will run on cell phones, tablets. Uh, you can run on Android, iPhone, etc. Um, you know, emerging technology devices like uh, a washer dryer or television or um, a refrigerator. You could even program it with that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot that Python will run on, which is pretty cool. So it's really nice because you just code one program once and it just runs on everything after that. So it's very, very slick and uh, makes your coding uh, a lot easier. There's most programming languages, that's not the case, but in the, in the dealing with Python, that is. All right. I had to let, make Windows allow it uh, to install it, and then now it's installing. And basically, we have that going. And after we're done, what's going to pop up? We're going to be interested in a program called Idle, in particular. Uh, Idle is going to be your way of interacting, doing interactive coding in this. And um, we're able to then write up programs in there. There's other um, programs you can use for coding Python uh, in them. Um, they're usually referred to as IDEs, Integrated uh, Development Environments. Um, it's just a technical term out there for it. Essentially what it means is it's a set of software for testing your code and finding mistakes in it. And as you start typing stuff, it automatically starts filling in what you're typing because uh, it kind of like knows what you're typing. So uh, it lets you write your code faster and easier with fewer mistakes. So that it's pretty nice. And that's referred to as an IDE. Aptana is one of them. Um, I can pull that up if you like. Uh, let's see here. So after it's done, though, we'll get this. And so the thing I'm going to look for is idle. So I D L E. I D L E comes up, and okay. So we got a couple of different ones. Uh, I'm not sure which is which on here because <laughs> I have another Python on here, older one I think. Let's click it and find out, right? The other way I could have done it is gone into Windows here and gone to All Programs and then scrolled down until I found Python. Here's Python. Oh, and I do have different versions of it. All right, cool. And then you can just run it like so. All right, so this is 3.3. So this is the one that matches. You won't have all these different versions because I just... I do Python, so I've got lots of awesome uh, stuff as far as that goes. All right, so this is Python. And we're in here with our Python shell, if you will. And the cool part about this is it's really easy to start programming. Check it out. So if I say like 10 plus 5, bam, I just did a line of code. That was code. And it came back with a result of 15. So that we're, we're now programming at this point. It's, it's that simple. You can just say something like 3 plus 5, we get 8. Pow. There we go. Uh, but we can do more than just add. I mean, of course, we can do like uh, 4 uh, times uh, 5, get 20. And we can do stuff like uh, 20 uh, divided by 5, get 4. Um, so you get the idea here. And then you could also do subtraction. You can do 3 minus 2, it gets 1. Um, but this is all fine and good. We want to start storing stuff, though, into memory, into our RAM. And so what we need to do is actually store these values. Because the moment that we do one of these calculations, it's just gone. The, the computer forgets it. So the moment it does this, it just forgets it. So what we need to do is give the computer a memory, like a brain, and have it to where it can remember what this is going to what it's going to be using later on. So say we want to hold on to this value and just not have it disappear, then we need to do something uh, that would actually store that. So for instance, maybe I had a variable called result, and I say it's equal to 10 plus 5, for instance. Bam. 
I get nothing back. Why not? Well, it's because it got stored into this variable right here called result. So now the value of 10 plus 5 is stored in result. Great. And I can prove this. If I say just result like this, check it out, 15 is stored inside of it. So the result is just a variable, just like you would use in algebra or something of that nature. It's a container that just holds the data inside of it. In this case, it's a 15. But, I mean, it could be anything, really. Uh, literally, it could be anything. <laughs> we'll get into that later here. But um, let's do some more with this. So in addition to that, though, I could have, like, num1, short for number. Now, there are some rules to this. Uh, when I'm naming variables, there are certain things I can and cannot do. I cannot say, like, 7up, for instance, but I could say up7. The reason why is because I cannot start a variable name with a number. So doing 7up is not allowed because it starts with a uh, number. I can start with an underscore or a letter. That's the only two. It could be uppercase letter or lowercase letter or an underscore. That's the only thing that's allowed. Also, after that though, um, for after we start the variable, we can do whatever we want as far as, um, we can't do like dollar signs or anything like that, but we can do uh, characters like uh, A, B, C, the alphabet, alphanumerics as it's referred to. We can do um, alpha basically your um, alphabet you can do your number system uh, you can also do the underscore and that's it you can't do any other symbols like you can't do at symbol like you're writing an email address you can't do that it's not allowed you can't do an exclamation mark you can't do a period that's used for something else so it's special uh, these different command these different symbols have special meanings and so you can't use them uh, when you're naming a variable so I'm going to call mine num for number. You always want to do what's called descriptive variables, where you uh, basically come up with the, the name for the variable, where it kind of says what it is. So in this case, when I'm saying num1, I'm making it short for number one. So it's going to be the first number here. And maybe I decide I want it to be three. And I'm going to create another variable called num2, and it's going to be the second number, and uh, maybe just four. And then I can say result right from before and I can say num1 plus num2 and I say enter now if I type in result check it out I get 7 it overwrote what was stored in it so it got rid of 15 15's toast now the 15 from above right here when we did this calculation up here is now gone we overwrote it um, and so it doesn't exist in memory anymore so that's something to be aware of you can't hang on to a value if you override it. It's gone uh, from the computer. And a lot of times that's what you want. Um, but if you need to uh, hold on to the value, then you need to store the, a variable into another variable. For instance, um, maybe I call a variable called backup or something like that, and or temp for temporary. Uh, maybe it's a temporary variable. I'm just coming up with variable names. Now if I say temp here, it now stores the value that was inside a result from earlier here. So now temp, and now I can make a change to result over here. You know, I could say like uh, result equals num1 plus num2. Actually, instead of um, adding them, let's multiply them. Bam. All right, so now if I say result, check it out, it's 12. But if I say temp, it's still 7 because we stored the value up here of what result was at this point in time into temp. And so that's pretty cool because what we had up here is we took the value from inside of num1 and which was 3 sitting in the computer memory and we took the value inside of num2 uh, which is 4 and we grabbed that from memory. So to the computer when it reads this line it always reads right to left uh, for doing these evaluations here. Um, so the stuff on the uh, left hand side is going to get evaluated last. So the equal sign over here, that's going to happen last. And it's going to do this first. So it's going to look at num1 and it's going to replace it with a 3. It's because it goes, all right, variable num1, all right, let's go look into our memory and find out what's stored in there. So it goes and looks at num1 and it finds 3, right? And then it goes to num2. And it looks into memory and it finds 4. So then we have what? To the computer, this is 3 plus 4, right? Because 3 from here for this one, ah, can't highlight it right, and 4 from this one right here. 
Awesome. And then those get added together, and 3 plus 4 is 7, and 7 then gets stored into result right here. So that's how that works. And that's why when I said result here, I got back 7, because that's stored in there. Okay. So this is kind of how this all works. And you can kind of see it all coming together here. We can do other things than just math, though. Uh, math is really great, but there's other things we can do besides that. We could also say, um, uh, let's see here. Let's just do a simple uh, saying for a child. Uh, let's say a variable r um, child um, Mm, child talk. How about child talk? I guess. Um, so that's just the name of a variable. Notice I start camel casing it. The reason why I did that is so that um, when I got from this word to this next word, it made it easy for me to read it. So when you start the next word here, you typically want to capitalize the next, the first letter of the next word, so that it's readable. Another method you could do would be underscore, but typically um, we just capitalize the first letter of the next word when you're doing that in a variable, when you're naming them. And that's really good uh, practice to get into. That's what we use a lot in the programming industry. So I kind of want to do that. But I'm going to create a text that I'm going to store into this variable. And this is referred to as string. Anytime you're doing like text, like you're, you're writing up a, well, like this, um, are we there yet? All right, um, and so this is text right here, and it's referred to as a string in programming. Every programming language they call it a string. Um, not real sure why they call it a string. A string of characters is what basically is what they call it, um, which means text basically. Um, so when I do this, it's going to take this text, this string, and it's going to store it into the variable child talk. And it's going to be held in memory. So check this out. When I do this, then if I say, so move this up a little bit here. And if I say uh, child talk, we get, are we there yet? Uh, and the answer is no, of course. Um, but child doesn't stop there, right? So just because we had uh, a text there, we can actually do mathematical operations with text, but it does something different with it. So for instance, if I said like 25, uh, if I multiply child talk by 25, it's going to repeat uh, that string 25 times. And we get, are we there yet? 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 So essentially we're simulating a small child, which uh, is always fun. Later on, you'll learn uh, condition statements for dealing with this small child uh, <laughs> in the long trip ride. Basically, um, this lets us do things with the text here. Besides that, we can also do other type of math mathematical operations. So, for instance, um, if I had child talk in here, let's have a parent response right, equals no. <laughs> something like that right there right all right cool so there's our parent response so if I said child talk plus parent response <laughs> uh, check it out I accidentally made that P capital P that points out a good uh, issue here. The computer doesn't know. All right, so computers aren't that smart. People think they are, but all the cool stuff computers do is really smart people writing uh, code that makes computers do crazy awesome stuff. So basically, what you what's happening here is I accidentally put a capital P here instead of the lowercase p, and so the computer could not tell that I really meant, instead of meaning this, I really meant this one right here, simply because I made the P capital. In programming languages, uh, this is considered a whole new variable. It's not even the same variable. Just by making 
one letter capital or lowercase. So all you have to do, slightest little difference like that will make a difference in your code. And a computer isn't really smart enough in order to figure out that, um, you know, what it really meant was this one here. So you have to tell everything to the computer exactly what you mean, down to the smallest thing, because the computer just can't figure it out, basically. So what I need to do is do child talk, capital T here, uh, plus uh, parent, lowercase p this time, response. All right, and so are we there yet? And then no, it puts it there. So I'm going to do conv, uh, con, uh, get a convo, but conv uh, for conversation. I don't feel like typing out conversation all the way. So I'm just going to call my variable conv <laughs> talk. Uh, and I'm going to do plus here, parent, response. Or I tell you what, actually, you know what? I, I could do it that way, but I don't want to. I want to change my mind on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do a little bit of math with the, a little bit more math here. Uh, with these variables with text and the cool part about this is you can actually use parentheses to organize your thoughts or your, your ways you, the way you want the code to execute for your operations uh, basically what I mean here is I want it to add child talk to parent response before I want to multiply it so in order to make it do that I put it inside parentheses because it has to do whatever's inside of parentheses first so because of that then even though I have this times 25 over here it's not gonna happen first it's gonna happen last because these parentheses get precedence over it so you can change the order in which it views things so now when I hit enter we get are we there yet no 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 etc so you get this whole conversation going back and forth between the child and the parent over and over and over again on the car ride so you, know, you can see a way of actually putting these parentheses. Parentheses are a very useful thing. If you start doing some crazy long math formula or something like that, definitely start using parentheses. You can sit there and go, oh, well, my dear Aunt Sally or whatever uh, for doing the whole um, remembering the order of uh, operations. Basically, you have power operations before multiply, before divide, before add, before subtract. You know, that's typical, and I think modulus is last. Uh, but it doesn't really work that way on a computer so much. Multiply and divide are at the same level of precedence, meaning that they have the same order in which they get executed, which is a little different than math. And then add and subtract are on the same precedence, but they're lower than multiply and divide. So for that reason, uh, you definitely want to use parentheses as much as possible. Because uh, otherwise, uh, you'll end up getting a wrong solution to your formula and then things just won't calculate right and actually hunting down a formula mistake is pretty difficult to do a lot of times because you'll have a lot of code and you won't be able to figure out why you're getting this wrong answer back and it could be just because you didn't put parentheses on something because you thought it was going to do this mathematical operation in a certain order and then it doesn't uh, it doesn't in the way it's supposed to do it and you didn't quite think it through all the way correctly so in order to get around that so you don't make mistakes like that then you definitely want to start putting things in parentheses so doing these parentheses like this are quite useful so I say like num uh, one uh, plus num two and then I could say oh I want to divide them by uh, 25 or something like that and then then I want to multiply it times uh, three so here, we, here's a good example of this. So if I didn't have these parentheses here, you know, this becomes a mess. So how is it going to execute it, right? So we got that. But let's look at what happens if we put parentheses around this. Uh, something totally different. Check that out. Yeah, so parentheses really matter to the order which you want something to be done. So now I'm going to change the order a bit more. I'm going to tell it, okay, first we're going to add these together here 
So, you know, the innermost parentheses has to get done first before the outermost. And it works from inside out. So, like, these would be, this would, this part right here would be first because these are the inner parentheses. And then the next parentheses will be done, which will be these right here, right? And then this gets done last, whatever is not in parentheses. So you can really tell the computer, I want to do it in this order. And in this case, that is how it worked out mathematically, because, you know, after it went, uh, did the side of the equation on the right, because there's no equal sign, it started executing it left to right from there. And so that's why it did divide by 25 before multiply by 3, because it was more to the left than multiply by 3 was. <laughs> so there's a gotcha for you. Even though, like, in mathematics, you're like, oh, well, multiply is, you know, higher precedence than divide. Not in computer programming, it isn't. It's at the same level of precedence. And so what determined that divide by 25 happened before multiply by 3 was the fact that this is more to the left-hand side of the equation than this is right here. So if I had something like my result again, equals... Again, we're going to do what's to the right-hand side. So we don't do this equal sign here. We have to first compute the rest of this here. And then, once we're on this side here, we start doing things left to right. But the parentheses tell it we're going to do this first. Then we're going to do this. And then we're going to multiply it times 3 last because it's the only thing not in parentheses. And so now when I say result, I get back this number. Something else I want to um, point out too is that we can actually handle really big numbers in Python, and this, most languages can't do this, but Python sure can. So I can store, when I say really big numbers, I mean really big numbers. And so this is why NASA likes it so much. It's because you store these massive numbers that you need to calculate uh, physics and uh, pro different uh, aspects as you're talking about huge numbers dealing with space and I can just do that and then I can say big num most programming languages wouldn't allow that but this one does and so now I can do this massive crazy long number and it'll just work it'll just handle it and so I can say big num for instance plus num1 and then that's my result <laughs> of that yeah, just do that in your head, no problem, right? <laughs> Let's get. So you see, uh, it added three became a six here. So num one had three in it. So if I say num one, if I say, uh, sorry, trying to type. All right, let me type. Thank you. Num one. See, that's three. So this three plus three here gave me six. So this whole long number, and that's the result. And you can see just how fast the computer can do numbers. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, just as a for instance, big num two equals sorry. Ah, I accidentally put a subtract in there. Let me do something about that. Yeah, big num. All right, so big num plus big num two. Yeah, it's very creative for the names. <laughs> But there they are, added together. So, very cool. And we get this massive size number here for the result. We can also multiply them, though. I could say big num times big. You're like, oh, no, no, it's too big. Nope, it'll do it. It will. Check it out. Bam, there it is. There's that number. So the computer's really fast and very efficient and can do massive size numbers that a regular person would take them quite a bit of time to work it out. And the computer can do it really quick. And so that's the real benefit of it. You can automate tasks. You can do uh, calculations really quick in a computer. And thus you can solve for whatever it is you need to find the answer to really, really fast. But you have to figure out how to do it. The computer can't figure out how to do it. You can tell the computer what to do, and then the computer will do it. So that's what the whole point of the programming is. The computer can't think on its own. We have to do the thinking for it, but it can calculate stuff really fast, and it's really good at that. 
So that's really why we're uh, going through all this. So when we add these together or multiply them together, you, know, you get this result here. You could also divide them. You know, if you imagine just doing this math without a computer, it'd be uh, and there it is. That, that's the uh, that's the solution to that. Pow! You could take it to the power of. I mean, gee, Christmas. Yeah, you could. So, but we're not going to. But basically, that hopefully gives you the idea. In the next video, we're going to go over how to start writing this into a file, so that way we can just call up all our all the uh, different things we want to do all at once, and then we don't have to type it up each time. Because as I'm typing this stuff up, it's just disappearing each time I do it. Uh, so like I couldn't come back and then make it do all these different commands again with just one command the way it is right now. Right now, after I do it, it's it's done. You know, I'd have to if I wanted to do this again later on, I would have to type all this stuff again to make it do all this stuff again. So later on, uh, in the next video, what I'm going to do is show you that we can come in here and choose new window, and we can actually type it inside of this uh, window here, and uh, this code would then be stored in here, and we can actually reuse it over and over again. And we'll get into that into the next video. All right? But with that, uh, my name is Nate Nessler, and this is for Hyperactive Studios. Thank you very much.